B-24s flying hundreds of miles to the north from bases on Wake D Island attacked the Palau Archipelago. The frequent bombings helped to neutralize the enemy's offensive power prior to amphibious invasions. These islands constitute a strategic barrier to the Philippines. Mindanao is some 500 miles due east. The enemy should develop the Palaus as a principal advanced naval base and assembly point for fuel, ammunition, and supplies passing between Japan and the Southwest Pacific. Coordinated with the land-based heavy bomber sorties is carrier aircraft support from Task Force 58. Torpedo bombers and their fighter escorts leave flight decks to join in the attacks. The combined operations greatly reduce the importance of the Palaus as a Japanese fleet anchorage and air base. In conjunction with the aircraft, surface vessels of Admiral William F. Halsey's 3rd Fleet move in to attack gun emplacements, pillboxes, and other defenses on the beaches and inland. The assault is concentrated mainly on Peleliu and Angaur Islands. Five successive days of bombing and shelling climax the pre-invasion foray. September, initial forces head for Peleliu for first landings in the Palau group. The shelling of the island continues, supplemented by fire from landing craft. Marines of the 1st Division, commanded by Major General William S. Rupertus, drive in force toward the beaches. Reports from Peleliu credit the relatively light losses to the extremely effective call fire and close support fire from the warships offshore and to the accuracy of bombings by the carrier-based aircraft. Peleliu was chosen for the first attack because it contains the best airfield of the archipelago. Within the island, the enemy garrison is holding out in pillboxes, caves, and trenches. The strongest point of resistance is along a low coral ridge, nicknamed Bloody Nose Ridge by the Marines. A command post and communication system are quickly set up. Meanwhile, Marines move on the airfield against stiffening resistance. to the northern and eastern limits of the airfield, which is captured by noon of the 16th. Bombers, fighters, and transports are found by the Marines. Construction equipment is brought up to the beaches and driven to the airfield. A power shovel speeds the job of whipping the airstrip into shape. Natural coral deposits provide surfacing material. The airdrome has two runways, both approximately 4,000 feet long, with 460-foot turning circles at either end. From here, our fighter planes can strike against the entire Palau group. First landings on the captured airfield. Army troops of the 81st Division, which successfully invaded nearby Angaur Island, helped end the fierce fighting for Peleliu. On 
Iwo Jima. Our tanks come in range of enemy 77 millimeter guns, which score several hits. Marines dig out hidden and camouflaged installations. Tanks are used to burn enemy traps out of natural cave positions in volcanic ridges and hills. Destroying enemy troops in underground pockets. Rockets brought up on truck carriers augment artillery, tank, and rifle fire. The Battle of EO lasts 30 days. <laughs> Invasion of Panay Island, Central Philippines. 7th Amphibious Attack Forces land troops of the 40th Division, 8th Army, on the southeast coast of the island. Capture of Panay opens second largest Philippine port to American shipping. Little enemy opposition is encountered as our troops quickly establish a beachhead near Tigbawan, about 14 miles west of the important harbor city of Iloilo. Filipino civilians welcome the invading forces. Major General Rapp Brush, commander of the 40th Division, directs the push inland. Opposition fails to develop as units move ahead. Contact is made with strong Filipino guerrilla forces controlling all island areas except the Iloilo region. After overcoming light enemy resistance centered in concrete pillboxes and trenches, our troops advance through the town of Molo. Tanks and infantry mop up enemy machine gun emplacements and resistance pockets outside Iloilo. Advance units of the 40th Division capture Iloilo, 20th March. Enemy destroyed 70% of the city, but harbor facilities were undamaged. Lieutenant General Robert L. Eichelberger, commanding the 8th Army, enters Iloilo shortly after its capture. Filipino civilians welcome our men. Honoring the Filipino guerrillas for their services against the enemy on Panay, General Eichelberger presents the Distinguished Service Cross to Colonel Macario Peralto, their commanding officer. Force films of an airborne hospital which solved one problem of the Leyte campaign. A field station is set up at Manarawat Leyte by parachuting a medical team and equipment into the jungle. Skilled surgeons, surgical assistants, delicate instruments, anesthetics, medicine, and plasma are dropped in to help units which have fought through the jungle beyond the reach of overland supply. The hospital was established to service the 1st and 3rd battalions of the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Both C-47s and small liaison planes are used for dropping the equipment and personnel. Stacking ammunition brought in for the front lines. Preparations are made for a trip into the jungle where the fighting is going on. Ammunition and rations are included along with the medical supplies. Purpose is to bring out wounded for hospitalization. Native animals are used to cover the rough jungle terrain. As soon as an adequate airstrip is cut out, the L-4 and L-5 liaison planes are used to bring in vital medical supplies and take out badly wounded patients.
A valuable supply of blood plasma is brought in for the jungle hospital. Agus cases have been given emergency treatment. They are evacuated by air with an improvised litter installed in an L-4 plane. of Task Force 58 under Vice Admiral Mark A. Mitcher as it proceeds through heavy seas on its way toward the Tokyo area. Objective is to tie down the Japanese Air Force so that it can't intercept the large force of transports, landing craft, and supply ships heading northward for landings on Iwo Jima. Approaching the target, weather conditions continue adverse. 16th February, pilots leave the briefing room on their way to the planes. Takeoffs are imperiled by the heavy seas. Fifteen hundred planes take part in the attack. Heavy storm clouds blanket the Tokyo area. Mount Fujiyama. One of our planes strafes a ship in the harbor. an enemy interceptor. Japanese aircraft factories are struck heavily. The attack continues for more than nine hours. Next day, it's followed up with another attack lasting more than eight hours. Throughout the attacks, the enemy offers only slight resistance. Our losses amount to nine fighter planes and four pilots. Four of Japan's largest and most important engine and assembly plants received devastating blows during the two-day strike. Strafing planes caught on the airfields. About 2,000 are found on the ground. Altogether, 659 enemy planes are destroyed in the air and on the ground. being wiped out at the northern end of EO, supplies pour into the southern beaches. Evacuating wounded men to a hospital ship. Mopping up operations continue to unearth Japanese hiding in the many caves dug in the cliffs and sides of volcanoes. Many of the Japanese gun installations are in caves 30 to 40 feet deep. The small exposed part blends so well with the surroundings that they can't be discovered until they open fire. Even then, the heaviest bombs, including 12,000-pound AP, frequently have no effect. Many of the emplacements are so situated that they could not be hit from the sea or the air. Infantry had to wipe them out. B-29 makes an emergency landing. Returning from a mission, the bomber would have had to land in the ocean if EO hadn't been taken. Yeah. 
infantry and tank units of Company I, 503rd Paratroop Regiment, mop up on Corregidor. Sniper and machine gun pockets in the hills near Breakwater Point are destroyed by our troops moving against strong enemy resistance. Guns from American destroyers pour shells into the area to cover the paratroopers' advance. Machine gun fire reduces enemy positions. Troops of Company F, 503rd Paratroop Regiment, close in on a fortified artillery magazine. An 81mm mortar fires smoke shells on a strong point to identify the target for bombing. Low-flying planes strafe the enemy. blown-up powder magazine destroyed by the enemy to halt our advance. Companies A and B of the 1st Battalion on a patrol mission were trapped and wiped out in the explosion. A knocked-out U.S. tank. Troops of the 3rd Battalion moving up to replace the 1st Battalion pass American ambulances wrecked in the explosion. Fire Direction Center of a Parachute Field Artillery Battalion controlling gunfire on the eastern part of Corregidor. A heavy artillery barrage prepares the way for the infantry advance. Patrols move along the beach at Rock Point, cleaning out enemy pockets in caves and cliffs. Japanese suicide boats found along the shoreline of Corregidor. Each boat had a one-man crew and carried a 300-pound charge of dynamite. Several of our ships were rammed and sunk by the boats. PT boats cross Manila Bay to Corregidor, bringing General Douglas MacArthur to the island for flag-raising ceremonies. General MacArthur is met at the dock by Colonel George M. Jones, commanding officer of the 503rd Regiment. Inspecting the large coastal defense guns at Wheeler Battery overlooking the entrance to Manila Bay. The general enters the west end of Malinta Tunnel. General MacArthur arrives at the site of the flag-raising ceremony near the ruins of the officers' quarters. During the ceremony, General MacArthur cited the 503rd Regimental Combat Team for brilliant action on Corregidor and presented Colonel Jones with a Distinguished Service Cross. The American flag is raised on Corregidor for the first time since 22nd March, 1942. In his speech, General MacArthur called the recapture of Corregidor one of the most brilliant exploits in all military history and enjoined the troops to hoist the colors and let no enemy ever haul them down. Chinese-owned and operated junks carrying supplies on the Yungning River, China. The junks are pulled upstream by teams of coolies. When the junks reach a point in the narrow river canyons where fast-flowing rapids make the job too strenuous for a single team, the boats are temporarily anchored, and the coolie teams combine efforts to pull a single boat at a time through the difficult stretch. The coolies chant a song similar to that of the Volga boatmen to help them pull in unison. Shortage of normal facilities forces our army to use every available means of Chinese transportation. These coolie carts are used to bring empty gasoline drums from the airfield to various alcohol factories. Alcohol is the main fuel for American convoys and has to be transported from the factories about 150 miles to our supply base. Filled drums in the storehouse. The drums are reshipped by means of mule cart trains. Arriving at the American convoy station near our supply base, a GI and a Chinese contractor check the load. Filling the tank of a convoy truck. 
A convoy on the way to the alcohol factories waits to be ferried across the Luho River. Oars made of unshaped poles reveal the extremely primitive facilities in use. Reaching the other side of the river, observers report this to be the sort of transportation our armies will encounter as they penetrate the interior of China. Troops bivouacking in the hills bordering the Burma Road show originality in building temporary homes for themselves. These crude but comfortable shelters are known as bashas. Some bashas are simply tents made of canvas or parachute silk coverings. Others are more elaborately constructed, even to having indoor fireplaces with hollow bamboo smokestacks. The wooden frames of the shelters are made of timber chopped in the nearby woods. The bashas are usually covered with canvas mantas, which were originally used for wrapping pack mule cargo. A few are large enough to accommodate four men. A wash basin stand. Bamboo wood with which the area abounds is used for everything. The shower bath is also constructed of bamboo, which resists rotting from water or dampness. The bamboo makes excellent furniture. This bed, when covered with straw or other mattress material, will furnish comfortable sleeping accommodations. Tables and chairs are made from the resilient wood, which can be easily cut with machete or GI knife. Rope to tie the pieces together is obtained from parachutes. Since the troops are supplied mostly by air, plenty of chutes are available for building purposes. Shelters are constructed with any materials at hand. Roofs are even made of burlap feed bags and corrugated box sides. These boshes show that the soldiers have been able to make even the wild Burma jungle livable. 